Hello, good evening and welcome. This is my first podcast and in today's podcast we'll read the book Sapiens written by Yuval Noah Harari. Sapiens, a brief history of humankind. तो ये मेरे जो आज का टॉपिक है ये बुक है उसका टाइटल है सैपियंस अ ब्रीफ हिस्ट्री ऑफ ह्यूमन काइंड और ये बुक बहुत ही पॉपुलर बुक है और एक बहुत इंटरेस्टिंग जो ह्यूमन ओरिजिन से लेके जो लाइफ की ओरिजिन है एक्चुअली यूनिवर्स की ओरिजिन से लेके अभी तक के लाइफ के बारे में ये जो इवोल्यूशनरी एस्पेक्ट है ह्यूमन का ह्यूमन इवोल्यूशन के बारे में उसके बारे में डिस्कस किया है डिस्क्राइब किया है बहुत अच्छा है बुक का जो लैंग्वेज है बुक की लैंग्वेज है वो बहुत अच्छी है बहुत स्मूथ है यू कैन रीड वेरी वेल बट कभी कभी क्या होता है कि हम पढ़ना नहीं चाहते हैं या हम पढ़ नहीं पाते हैं बट हम सुन तो सकते हैं सो वेन वी आर नॉट एबल टू रीड और वेन वी डू नॉट वॉन्ट टू रीड देन वी लिसन और पॉडकास्ट का इम्पोर्टेंस उसी टाइम के लिए होता है वेन यू स्लीप और वेन यू एट रेस्टिंग पोजिशन यू जस्ट टेक आउट योर हेडफोन एंड पुट इट एंड लिसन इट जस्ट यू हैव टू स्विच ऑन द पॉडकास्ट एंड यू जस्ट क्लोज योर आईज एंड लिसन जैसे बहुत अच्छा सा कोई खूबसूरत सा म्यूजिक हो वैसे ही ये बुक है मार्वलस बुक है सो विल रीड ओनली ओके आई विल ट्राई टू रीड इन अ बेस्ट वे और ये पहला पॉडकास्ट है तो हो सकता है थोड़ा स्लो हो मे बी थोड़ा स्लो का मतलब पॉडकास्ट है तो स्लो ही रखूँगा मैं क्योंकि okay, रीड करूँगा और ये बुक वन गो में रीड नहीं होगी अच्छी खासी लेंथ में है बुक ठीक है और ये बुक का इम्पोर्टेंस ये है कि प्रोफेसर साइंटिस्ट इस्कॉलर्स एंड जो अदर स्टूडेंट्स हैं जो लर्न स्टूडेंट हैं ठीक है उनके बुक सेल्फ में आपको दिख जाएगा अगर आप थोड़े से भी इस्कॉलरली एटीट्यूड रखते हैं सो आप अगर ऑब्जर्व करेंगे चीज़ों को तो हम देखे हैं क्योंकि हमने देखा है यूनिवर्सिटीज़ के जो प्रोफेसर हैं बहुत लोगों के बुक सेल्फ में ये बुक है मतलब इसका जो पॉपुलरिटी है इसके नाम से ही जाता है सैपियंस अ ब्रीफ हिस्ट्री ऑफ ह्यूमन काइंड ओके सो वी आर गोइंग टू स्टार्ट द फर्स्ट लेसन द पार्ट वन द कॉग्नेटिव रिवोल्यूशन और ये ध्यान रखिए कि ये कई पार्ट में होगा ठीक है वन लेंथ में नहीं होगा वन गो में नहीं होगा हो सकता है कि अच्छा खासा लेंथ तक चले क्योंकि मेरे पास जितना टाइम अवेलेबल है उसी में से एक टाइम स्लॉट हम यहाँ स्टार्ट कर रहे हैं और ये स्टार्टिंग पॉइंट है ठीक है देखते हैं इसका क्या रिस्पांस मिलता है हालांकि बहुत सारे सोर्सेज पे हमने देखा है पॉडकास्ट अवेलेबल रहता है बहुत सारी चीज़ों का स्टोरीज का ठीक है नाइट टाइम स्टोरीज एंड अदर थिंग्स का सो लेट सी लेट सी ये कैसा जाता है ठीक है सो so, इसमें स्टार्ट करते हैं जो पहला पार्ट है उसका पहला लेसन है चैप्टर एन एनिमल ऑफ नो सिग्निफिकेंस About 14 years, 14 billion years ago, matters, energy, time, and space came into being in what is known as the Big Bang. The story of these fundamental features of our universe is called physics. About three lakh years, or 300,000 years, after their appearance, matter and energy started to coalesce into complex structures called atoms which then combined into molecule the story of atoms molecules and their interactions is called chemistry about 4 billion years ago on a planet called earth certain molecules combined to form particularly large and intricate structures called organism The story of organism is called biology. About seventy thousand year ago, organism belonging to the species Homo sapiens started to form even more elaborate structure called structures, called culture. The subsequent development of these human cultures is called history. 
three important revolutions shaped the course of history the cognitive revolution kick started history about 70000 years ago the agricultural revolution sped it up about 12000 years ago that is the neolithic revolution actually the scientific revolution which got under way only 500 years ago may well end history and start something completely different this book tells us the story of how these three revolutions have affected humans and their fellow organisms there were humans long before there was history animals much like modern humans first appeared about 2.5 million million years ago but for countless generations they did not stand out for the myriad other organisms that populated the planet on the hike in east africa 2 million years ago you might well have encountered a familiar cast of human characters anxious mothers cuddling their babies and clutches of carefree children playing in the mud temperamental youths chafing against the dictates of the society and weary elders who just wanted to be left in peace just thumping machos trying to impress the local beauty and wise old matriarchs who had already seen it all these archaic ya yeah, archaic human loved played formed close friendship and compared for status and power but so did chimpanzees baboons and elephants there was nothing special about humans nobody least of hu- all human themselves had any inkling that their descendants would one day walk on the moon split the atom fathom the genetic code and write history books the most important thing to know about prehistoric humans is that they were insignificant animals with no more impact on their environment that than gorillas fireflies or jellyfish biologists classify organisms into species animals are said to belong to the same species if they tend to mate with each other that is the concept of biological species giving birth to fertile offspring horses and donkeys have a recent common ancestors and share many physical traits but they show little sexual interest in one another they will mate if induced to do so but their offspring called mules are sterile mules you know mutations in donkey dna can therefore never cross over to horse or vice versa the two types of animals are consequently considered to distinct in species moving along separate evolutionary path by contrast a bulldog bulldog and a spaniel may look very different but they are member of the same species sharing the same dna pool they will happily mate and their puppies will grow up to pair off with other dogs and produce more puppies a species that evolved from a common ancestors are bunched together under the heading genus plural genera lions tigers leopard and jaguars are different species within the same genus panthera biologists label organisms with two part latin name genus followed by the species lions for example are called panthera leo the species leo of the genus panthera presumably everyone reading this book is a homo sapiens definitely i am also a homo sapiens only the sapiens sapiens the species sapiens wise sapiens means wise of the genus homo that is man genera man or women okay 
genera in their turn are grouped into families such as the cats, lion, cheetah, house cats, the dogs, wolves, foxes, jackals, and the elephants, elephants, mammoths, and mastodons. All members of the family trace their lineage back to the founding matriarch or patriarch. All cats, for example, from the smallest house kitten to the most ferocious lion, share a common feline ancestor who lived about 25 million years ago. Homo sapiens too belong to a family. This banal fact used to be one, history, one of history's most closely guarded secrets. Homo sapiens long preferred to view itself as set apart from animals, an orphan who has no family, no cousins, and most importantly, no parents. But there, that's just not the case. Like it or not, we are members of a large and particularly noisy family called the Great Apes. Our nearest living relative includes chimpanzees, gorillas, and orangutans. The chimpanzees are the closest. Just 6 million years ago, a single female ape had two daughters. One became the ancestor of all chimpanzees and the other is our own grandmother. Okay, just wait for a second. The heading is Skeletons in the Closet or closet whatever you can say homo sapiens has kept hidden an even more disturbing secret not only do we possess an abundance of uncivilized cousins once upon a time we had quite a few brothers and sisters as well we are used to thinking about ourselves as the only humans because for the last 10,000 years our species has indeed has been or indeed been the only human species around yet the real meaning of the word human is an animal belonging to the genus homo and there used to be many other species of the same genus beside homo sapiens moreover as we shall see in the last chapter of the book in the not so distant future we might again have to contend with the non-sapiens humans to clarify this point i will often use the term sapiens so denote member to denote members of the species homo sapiens okay while reserving the term human to refer to all members of the genus homo got it humans first evolved in east africa about 2.5 million years ago uh, point the date okay from an earlier genus of apes called australopithecus which means southern ape about two million years ago some of these archaic men and women left their homeland to journey through and settle vast areas of north africa europe and asia since survival in the snowy forest of the northern Europe required different traits than those needed to stay alive in needed to stay alive in Indonesia's steaming jungles, human populations evolved in a different directions. The result was several distinct species to each of which scientists have assigned a pompous pompous Latin name. Humans in Europe and Western Asia evolved into Homo neanderthalensis, neanderthalensis, man from the Neander Valley, popularly referred to as Neanderthals, Neanderthals bulkier and more muscular than us sapiens, were all well adapted to the cold climate of Ice Age Western Eurasia. The more eastern regions of the Asia were populated by Homo erectus, the upright man who survived there for close to 2 million years ago or million years, making it the most durable human species ever. This record is unlikely to be broken 
Even by our own species, it is doubtful whether Homo sapiens will still be around a thousand years from now, so two million years is really out of our league. On the islands of Java in Indonesia lived Homo solensis, man from the Solo Valley, who was suited to life in the suited to life in the tropics. On another Indonesian island, the small island of Flores, archaic human underwent a process of dwarfing. Humans first reached floors when the sea level was exceptionally low and the island was easily accessible from the mainland. When the seas rose again, some people were trapped on the island which was, which was poor in resources big people who need a lot of food died first the smaller fellows survived much better over the generations the people of floors became dwarfs this unique species known by the scientist as homo florensis reached the maximum height of only one meter and weighed no more than 25 kilograms they were nevertheless able to produce stone tools and even managed occasionally to hunt down some of the island's elephants. Though, to be fair, the elephants were dwarf species as well. In 2010 or 2010, another lost sibling was rescued from the oblivion when scientists excavating the Denisova cave in Siberia discovered a fossilized finger bone. Genetic analysis proved that the finger belonged to a previously unknown human species which was named Homo denosiva Deni who knows who knows how many lost relatives of ours are waiting to be discovered in other caves, on other islands and in other climes. While these humans were evolving in Europe and Asia, evolution in East Africa did not stop. The cradle of humanity continued to, the, to nurture numerous new species such as Homo rudolfensis, man from the Lake Rudolph, Homo ergaster, working man, and eventually our own species which we have immodestly named Homo sapiens, a wise man. It is not modest, it is immodest according to him. The members of some, some of these species were massive and other were dwarfs. Some were fearsome, fearsome hunters and others meat plant gatherers. Some lived only on a single island while many roamed over continents. But all of them belonged to the genus Homo. They were all human beings. It's a common fallacy to envision these species as arranged in a straight line of descent with ergaster begetting erectors erectus begetting the neanderthals and the neanderthal evolving into us this linear model gives the mistaken impression that at any particular moment only one type of human inhabited the earth and that all earlier species were merely older model of ourselves the truth is that about from about two million years ago until around ten thousand years ago the world has home world was home at one and the same time to several human species and why not today there are many species of bears brown bears black bears grizzly bears polar bears the earth was once walked by at least six species of man it's our current exclusivity not that multi-species past that is peculiar and perhaps incriminating as we will shortly see we sapiens have good reasons to repress the memory of our siblings <coughs> the cost of thinking the cost of thinking the next heading despite their many differences all human species share several defining characteristics most notably, humans have extraordinarily large brains compared to the other animals. Mammals weighing 60 kg have an average brain size of 200 cubic centimeter. The 
earliest men and women 2.5 million years ago had brains of size of 600 cubic centimeters modern species sport a brain averaging 1200 to 1400 cubic centimeter neanderthal brains were even bigger around 1600 cubic centimeter the evolution should select for larger brains may seem as seem to us like well a no brainer we are so in a mode in a mode of our high intelligence that we assume that when it comes to cerebral power more must be better but if that were the case the feline family would also have produced cats who could do calculus and frogs would be now have launched their own space program why are giant brains so rare in the animal kingdom the fact is that a jumbo brain is a jumbo drain on the body it's not easy to carry around especially when encased inside a massive skull it's even harder to fuel. The Homo sapiens, the brain accounts for about 2 to 3 percent of the total body weight, but it consumes 25 percent of the body energy when the body is at rest. By comparison, the brains of other apes require only 8 percent of the rest time energy. Archaic human paid for their large brains in two ways. Firstly, they spent more time in search of food. Secondly, their muscles atrophied, like a government diverting money from defense to education. Human diverted energy from biceps to neurons. It's a hardly a foregone conclusion that this is a good strategy for survival on the savanna. A chimpanzee can't win an argument with a human homo sapiens, but the ape can rip the man apart like a ragdoll. Today our big brains pays off nicely because we can produce cars and guns that enable us to move much faster than chimps and shoot them from a safe distance instead of wrestling. But cars and guns are a recent phenomenon. For more than 2 million years ago, human neural network kept growing and growing. But apart from some flint knives and pointed sticks, human had precious little to show for it. What then drove forward the evolution of the massive human brains during these 2 million years? Frankly, we don't know. Another singular human trait is that we walk upright on two legs. Standing up, it's easier to scan the savanna for game or enemies and arms that are necessary for locomotion are freed for other purposes like throwing stones or signaling. The more things these hands could do, the more successful their owners were. So, evolutionary pressure brought about an increasing concentration of nerves and finely tuned muscles in the palms and fingers. As a result, humans can perform very intricate tasks with their hands, in particular that they can produce and use sophisticated tools. The first evidence for the tool production dated yeah, dates from, the, from about 2.5 million years ago and the manufacturer and the use of tools are the criteria by which archaeologists recognize ancient humans. Yet, walking upright has its downside. The skeleton of our primate ancestors developed for millions of years to support a creature that walked on all fours and had a relatively small head. Adjusting to an upright position was quite a challenge, especially when the scaffoldings had to support an extra large crane. Humankind paid for its lofty vision and industrious hands with backage, backage and stiff necks. Women per extra. An upright gait required narrower hips, constricting the birth canal, and this just when babies' heads were getting bigger and bigger 
death in childhood became a major hazard for human females. Women who gave birth earlier, when the infant's brain and head were still relatively small and supple, fared better and lived to have more children, natural selection consequently favored the earlier births. And indeed, compared to the other animals, humans are born prematurely when many of their vital systems are still underdeveloped and a colt can trot shortly after birth. A knitten leaves its mother to four hours on its own when it is just a few weeks old. Human babies are helpless, dependent for many years on their elders for sustenance, protection and education. This fact has contributed greatly both to humankind's extraordinary social abilities and to its unique social problems. Lone mothers could hardly forage enough food for their offspring and themselves with needy children in tow. Raising children required constant help from other family members and neighbors. It takes a tribe to raise a human. Evolution thus favored those capable of forming strong social ties. In addition, since humans are born underdeveloped, they can be educated and socialized to a far greater extent than any other animals. Most mammals emerge from the womb like laser glazed earthenware emerging from a kill. Any attempt at remolding will only scratch or break them. Humans emerge from the womb like molten glass from a furnace. They can be spun stressed and shaped with a surprising degree of freedom. This is why today we can educate our children to become Christian or Buddhist, capitalist or socialist, warlike or peace-loving. We assume that a large brain that uses of tools, superior learning abilities and complex social structures are huge advantage. It seems self-evident that these have made humankind the most powerful animal on the earth. But humans enjoyed all of these advantages for a full two million years during which they remained weak and marginal creatures. The humans who lived a million years ago, despite their big brains and sharp stone tools, dwelt in constant fear of predators, rarely hunted large game and subsisted subsisted mainly by gathering plants, scooping up insect, stalking small animals and eating the carrion left behind by other more powerful carnivores. Wet. Once one of the most common uses of early stone tool was to crack open bones in order to get the bone marrow. Some researchers believe this was our original niche, just as woodpeckers specialize in extracting insect from the trunks of trees, the first human specialized in extracting marrow from the bones. Why marrow? Well, suppose you observe a pride of lions take down and devour a giraffe. You wait patiently until they are done. But it's still not your turn because first the hyenas and jackals and you don't dare interfere with them scavenge the leftovers. Only then would you and your band dare approach the carcass, look cautiously left and right and dig into the edible tissue that remained. This is a key to understanding our history and psychology. Genus Homo's position in the food chain was, until quite recently, solidly in the middle. For millions of years, humans hunted smaller creatures and gathered what they could, all the while being hunted by larger predators. It was only four like years ago that several species of man began to hunt large game on a regular basis and only in the last one like years with the rise of homo sapiens 
the man jumped to the top of the food chain. The spectacular leap from the middle to the top had enormous consequences. Other animals at the top of the pyramid just such as lions and sharks evolved into that position very gradually over millions of years. This enabled the ecosystem to develop checks and balances that prevent lions and sharks from wreaking too much havoc. As lions became deadlier, so gazelles evolved to run faster, hyenas to cooperate better and rhinoceros to be more bad tempered. In contrast, humankind ascended to the top so quickly that the ecosystem was not given time to adjust. Moreover, humans themselves failed to adjust. Humans themselves failed to adjust. Most top predators of the planet are majestic creatures. Millions of years of dominion have filled them with self-confidence. Sapiens, by contrast, is more like a banana republic dictator. Having so recently been one of the underdogs of the savanna, we are full of fears and anxieties over our positions, which makes us doubly cruel and dangerous. Many historical calamities and deadly wars to ecological catastrophes have resulted from this over hasty jumps. Next heading, a race of cooks. A significant step on the way to the top was the domestication of fire. Some humans species may have made occasional use of fire as early as 8 lakh years ago. But by about 3 lakh years ago, Homo erectus neanderthals and the forefathers of Homo sapiens were using fire on a daily basis. Humans now had a dependable source of light and warmth and a deadly weapon against prowly lions. Not long afterwards, humans may even have started deliberately to torch their neighborhoods. A carefully managed fire could turn impassable, Im not impossible, impassable, barren thickets into prime grassland teeming with the game. In addition, once the fire died down, Stone Age entrepreneurs could walk through the smoking remains and harvest charcoal animals and nuts and tubers. But the best thing fire did was cook foods that humans cannot digest in their natural form such as wheat, rice and potatoes became staple of our diet thanks to the cooking. Fire not only changed food's chemistry, it changed its biology as well. Cooking killed germs and parasites that infested foods. Humans also had a far easier time chewing and digesting old favorites such as the fruits, nuts, insects and carrion if they were cooked. Whereas chimpanzees spend 5 hours a day chewing raw food, a single hour suffice for people eating cooked food. The advent of cooking enabled humans to eat more kind of foods, to devote less time to eating and to make to do with smaller teeth and shorter intestine. Some scholars believe there is a direct link between the advent of cooking and shortening of the human intestinal tract and the growth of the human brain. Since long intestine and large brains are both massive energy consumers, it's hard to have both. By shortening the intestine and decreasing their energy consumption, cooking inadvertently spend the, opened the way to the jumbo brains of Neanderthals and the sapiens. Fire also, fire also opened the first significant gulf between man and the other animal. The power of almost all animals depend on their bodies, the strength of their muscles and the size of their teeth and the breadth of their wings. Though they may harness winds and currents, they are unable to control these natural forces 
and are always constrained by their physical design. Eagles, for example, identify thermal columns rising from the ground, spread their giant wings and allow to hot air to lift them upward. Yet eagles cannot control the locations of the columns and their maximum carrying capacity is strictly proportional to their wing span. When humans domesticated fire, they gain control of an obedient and potentially limitless force. Unlike eagles, humans could choose when and where to ignite a flame and they were able to exploit fire for any number of tasks. Most importantly, the power of fire was not limited by the form, structure or strength of a human body. A single woman with a flint of fire stick or fire streak could burn down an entire forest in a matter of hours. Domestication of fire was a sign of things to come. Our brothers keep us. Next heading. Despite the benefits of the fire, 1,50,000 years ago humans were still marginal creatures. They could now scare of a lion warm themselves during cold nights and burn down the occasional forest, yet, counting all species together, there were still no more than perhaps a million humans living between the Indonesian archipelago and the Iberian Peninsula, a mere blip on the ecological radar. Our own species Homo sapiens was already present on the world stage, but so far it was just minding, yeah, minding its own business in a corner of Africa. We don't know exactly where and when animals that can be classified as Homo sapiens first evolved from some earlier type of humans, but most scientists agreed that by 150,000 years ago, East Africa was populated by sapiens that looked just like us. If one of them turned up in a modern morgue, the local pathologists would notice nothing peculiar thanks to the blessing of the fire they could be smaller they could they had a smaller teeth and jaws than their ancestors whereas they had massive brains and equal in size to our size to ours Okay. Scientists who also agree that about 70,000 years ago, sapiens from East Africa spread into the Arabian Peninsula and from there they quickly overran the entire Eurasian landmass. When Homo sapiens landed in Arabia, most of the Eurasia was already settled by other humans. What happened to them? There are two conflicting theories. The interbreeding theory tells a story of attraction, sex and mingling. As the African immigrants spread around the world, they bred with other human populations and today and the population today are the outcome of this interbreeding. For example, when sapiens reached the Middle East and Europe, they encountered the Neanderthals. These humans were more muscular than sapiens and had larger brains and were better adapted to cold climates. They used tools and fires, were good hunters and apparently took care of their sick and infirm. Archaeologists have discovered the bones of Neanderthals who lived for many years with their severe physical handicaps, evidence that they were cared for by their relatives. Neanderthals are often depicted in caricature as the archetypical brutish and stupid cave people, but recent evidences has changed their image. According to the interbreeding theory, when sapiens spread into Neanderthal lands, sapiens bred with Neanderthal until the two populations merged. If this is the case, then today's Eurasians are not pure sapiens, they are the mixture of sapiens and Neanderthals. Similarly, when sapiens reached East Asia, they interbreed with the local erectus, 
so the Chinese and Koreans are a mixture of sapiens and erectors. The opposing view called the replacement theory, it is the second theory, the replacement theory, tells a very different story. One of incompatibility, revulsion and the perhaps even genocide. According to this theory, sapiens and the other human had different anatomies and most likely different mating habits and even body orders. They would have had little sexual interest in one another. And even if a Neanderthal, Romeo and a sapiens Juliet fell in love, they could not produce fertile children because the genetic gulf separating the two populations was already, was already unbreasable. The two populations remained completely distinct and when the Neanderthals died, uh, died out uh, or were killed off, their genes died with them. According to this view, sapiens replaced all the previous human populations without merging with them. If, if that is the case, the lineage of all contemporary humans could be traced back exclusively to East Africa 70,000 years ago. We are all pure sapiens. A lot of hinges on this debate from an evolutionary perspective from an evolutionary perspective 70,000 years is a relatively short interval if the replacement theory is correct all living humans have roughly the same genetic baggage and the racial distinctions among them are negligible but if the interbreeding theory is right there might well be genetic differences between Africans Europeans and Asians that could go back hundreds of thousands of years. This is the political dynamite which could provide material for explosive racial theories. In recent decades, the replacement theory has been the common wisdom in the field. It had firmer archaeological backing and was more politically correct. Scientists had no desire to open up the Pandora's box of racism by claiming significant genetic diversity among the modern human populations. But that ended in 2010 when the results of a four-year effort to map the Neanderthal genome were published. Geneticists were able to collect enough intact Neanderthal DNA from fossils to make a broad comparison between it and the DNA of contemporary human. The results stunned the scientific community. The turned, it turned out that 1 to 4 percent of unique human DNA of modern population in the Middle East and the Europe is Neanderthal DNA. That's not a huge amount, but it's a significant. A second shock came several months later when DNA extracted from the fossilized finger from Denisova was mapped. The result proved that up to 6% of the unique human DNA of modern Melanesians and Aboriginal Australians is Denisovan DNA. If these results are valid, and it's important to keep in mind that further research is underway and may either reinforce or modify these conclusions, the interbreeders got at least some things right. But that does not mean that the replacement theory is completely wrong. Since Neanderthals and Denisovans contributed only a small amount of DNA to our present day genome, it is impossible to speak of a merger between sapiens and some other human sapiens or human species. Although differences between them were not large enough to completely prevent fertile intercourse, they were sufficient to make such contacts very rare. How then should we understand the biological relatedness of sapiens, Neanderthals and Denisovans? Clearly, they were not completely different species like horses and donkeys and on the other hand, they were not just different population of the same species like bulldog and sapinals, spaniels. Biological reality is not black and white. There are also important grey areas. Every two species that evolved from a common ancestors, such as horses and donkeys, were at one time just two populations of the same species. 
like bulldogs and spaniels. There must have been a point when the two populations were already quite different from one another but still capable on rare occasions of having sex and producing fertile offsprings than another mutations shivered or severed this last connecting thread and they went their separate evolutionary ways. It seems that about 50,000 years ago, sapiens, neanderthals and denisovans were at the borderline point. They were almost but not quite entirely separate species. As we shall see in the next chapter, sapiens were already very different from the neanderthals and denisovans not only in their genetic code and the physical trait but also in their cognitive and social abilities. Yet, it appears it, be, it was still not possible on rare occasions for a sapiens and a neanderthals to produce a fertile springs. So the populations did not merge but a few lucky neanderthals did hitch a ride on the sapiens express. It is unsettling and perhaps thrilling to think that we sapiens could at one time have sex with an animal from a different species and produce children together. But if the Neanderthals, Denisovans and other humans species did not merge with the sapiens, why did they vanish? One possibility is that Homo sapiens drove them to extinction. Imagine a sapiens band reaching a Balkan valley where Neanderthals had lived for hundreds of thousands of years. The newcomers began to hunt the deer and gather the nuts and berries that were the Neanderthals' traditional, traditional staples. Sapiens were more proficient hunters and gatherers thanks to the better technology and superior social skills so that they multiplied and spread. The less resourceful Neanderthals found it increasingly difficult to feed themselves. Their populations dwindled and they slowly died out except perhaps for one or two members who joined their sapiens neighbors. Another possibility is that competition for resources flared up into violence and genocide. Tolerance is not a sapiens trademark. In modern times a small difference in skin color dialects or religion has been enough to prompt one group of sapiens to set about exterminating another group. Would ancient sapiens have been more tolerant towards an entirely different human species? It may well be that when sapiens encountered Neanderthals, the result was the first and most significant ethnic cleansing campaign in history. Whichever way it was, it happened, the Neanderthals and the other human species pose one of history's great what apes. Imagine how things might have turned out had the Neanderthals or Denisovans survived alongside Homo sapiens. What kind of cultures, societies and political structures would have emerged in a world where several different human species coexisted? How, for example, would religious faith have unfolded? Would the books of Genesis have declared that Neanderthals descend from Adams and Eve? Would Jesus have died for the sins of the Denisovans and would the Qurans have reserved a seat in heaven for all righteous human? Whatever their species. Would Neanderthals have been able to serve in Roman legends or in the sprawling bureaucracy of imperial China? Would the American declarations of independence hold as a self-evident truth that all members of the genus Homo are created equal? Would Karl Marx have urged workers of all species to unite? Over the past 10,000 years, Homo sapiens has grown so accustomed to being the only human species that it hard, it's hard for us to convince or conceive of any other possibilities or lack of brothers and sisters make it easier to imagine that we are the epitome of creation and that a chasm 
separate us from the rest of the animal kingdom. When Charles Darwin indicated that Homo sapiens were just another kind of animal, people were outraged. Even today, many refuse to believe it. Had the Neanderthal survived, would we still imagine ourselves to creature apart? Perhaps this is exactly why our ancestors wiped out of Neander wiped out the Neanderthals. They were too familiar to ignore, but too different to tolerate. Whether sapiens are to blame or not, no sooner had they arrived at a new locations than the native population became extinct. The last remains of the Homo salensis are dated to about 50,000 years ago. Homo Denisova disappeared shortly thereafter. Neanderthals made their exit roughly 30,000 years ago. The last dwarf like humans vanished from Flores Island about 12,000 years ago. They left behind some bones, stone tools, a few genes in our DNA, and a lot of unanswered questions. They also felt behind us. They also left behind us Homo sapiens, the last human species. What was the sapiens secret of success? What was the sapiens secret of success? How did we manage to settle so rapidly in so many distant and ecologically different habitats? How did we push all other human species into oblivion? Why couldn't even the strong? Why couldn't even the strong, brainly, cold-proof Neanderthal survived out on slot? The debate continues to raise. The most likely answer is the very thing that makes the debate possible. Homo sapiens conquered the world, thanks above all to its unique language. So, next podcast will be later and the second chapter will be the the trees of knowledge or the tree of knowledge okay here we'll stop and listen listen it it will easier to listen than to read thank you have a nice listening